Hi boys and girls, welcome to episode 7 of Storytime with me, Ken Sanders, your host, or you can call me Grandpa. We're broadcasting live tonight uh, in the art gallery of my bookstore in downtown Salt Lake. Uh, we started doing these here, but then we switched to my library at my home, but we're having mysterious, weird sounds that we can't get rid of. So we'll see if we've left them behind. And after tonight's episode, maybe there will still be weird sounds. Who knows? I don't. Um, I've been browsing and looking at the gorgeous illustrations here to one of my very, very favorite books. Let me see if I can show it to you. The Rainbow Goblins. And we're going to, we're going to read The Rainbow Goblins tonight. It's beautifully, beautifully written and illustrated by Ulde Rico. Uh, he wrote and illustrated the book. This is my gigantic oversized folio edition that I bought brand new uh, back in the 1970s. And I'm going to read it, uh, read to you from this one. If you want one of your own, it'll have to be the in print size that they make today because this is an out-of-print collector's item. It's more this size, and this is the sequel to the Rainbow Goblins, and it's called The White Goblin. Now, these stories, they're beautifully illustrated, but for some of our younger readers, they might be a little bit scary. So, so scary goblin warning, okay? But they're really good. Before we start, though... Um, we're down here at the bookstore. We're trying to make plans to reopen the store, but we're trying to go by the science and what the number of COVID infections and the number of people that die from it. And um, they're not going up tremendously, but I don't really see that they've flattened or gone down yet. And that will be an indication to us at least when we're going to reopen the bookstore to browsing. We are making plans. We, we've got our contingency plans. By uh, Memorial Day weekend, right after, we will be opening the store on a by appointment basis. We'll start allowing up to six people uh, at a time to come in the store so we can uh, practice social distancing and stay six feet apart to keep from spreading the, the coronavirus and also everyone from the employees to our customers that come in the store will need to wear uh, masks as well. So we hope to be able to see you very, very soon now. And that probably will lead to a bit of a change up uh, in the story time show. I don't think I'll have time to do it every week anymore. I do love doing it because I love reading some of my favorite, favorite books and I will never get around to them all. So probably we're going to keep this YouTube channel. We got to name it. We've, we've had it for more than a month now, so we can, we can give it our own name. So we'll be doing that and doing some, you know, otherwise branding and stuff for it. Uh, but we're going to keep the YouTube, YouTube channel. We'll probably do the children's story time at least once a month, but I'm going to do other shows as well, maybe more for adults. Uh, couple of books before we get started though I can't remember if I've mentioned them before or not in this time of uh, change that we're going through um, you know the earth is our earth is really unsettled and I think mother earth is angry about all manner of things that we've done to it and that aren't very nice you know because sometimes we're too greedy about it and we need the mother earth we need our soil we need her seas we need her air in order to live on our planet and we need to take better care of her and there's this great climate activist that you may have heard of before Greta Thunberg and she actually caught the coronavirus herself and was ill from it even though she's a teenaged girl, still a child. This is her book called No One is Too Small to Make a Difference. And here's a larger work written by Greta Thunberg and her family called Our House is on Fire. And it's really good 
she's a really good thinker. She's a really smart, intelligent young woman, and uh, we ought to give a lot more thought than we do to what she and people like her are saying, so we can help our Mother Earth instead of instead of hurt her. So um, this is the giant rainbow goblin edition. This is the back cover. You can see the rainbow maybe there. And it's a really beautiful story. And we're going to read the whole story. Oh, you have to see the end sheets. Oh, my goodness. These are called marbled end papers. Aren't they beautiful? And they're made with wax and with colored inks. And you flow them. And they're really fun. Ulde Rico, the Rainbow Goblins. Now, as I said, this could be a little scary for the youngsters, so be careful here. Okay, it was kind of awkward to try and open up because it's huge. You can't really see how huge it is. And I can't see where the page is going. <laughs> the Rainbow Goblins by Ulde Rico. I'll try and show you all the artwork because it's so beautiful. Once there was a land that lived in fear of seven goblins. They were called the Rainbow Goblins, and each had his own color, which was also his name. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Yellow, being the craftiest, was the chief goblin. The goblins lived on color. They prowled the, prowled the valleys and climbed the highest mountains looking for rainbows. And when they found one, they caught it in their lassos, sucked the colors out of it, and filled their bellies with its bright liquid. Only one place in the land had never known goblin fear, the hidden valley called the Valley of the Rainbows, where the great arches of colors were born. There, the animals still lived in paradise. But the rainbow goblins had heard tales of this valley, and their mouths watered whenever they thought of the feast that awaited them there. So they gathered up their lassos and their pails, and they set off. With great effort, the goblins made their way over the jagged piles of rock that guarded the entrance. When the climbing became difficult, Yellow roared, Don't lose heart, comrades! Think of the delicious colors ahead. Here they are, headed for Rainbow Valley. It's hard to get this picture right. You see Rainbow Valley? Yeah. Oh, here they are. They're getting closer. Closer. The sun had almost set. By the time they reached their goal, the very meadow where the rainbow sprang to life. Immediately beneath the meadow, they found a cave. We'll spend the night here, the yellow goblin commanded. Pictures work tonight, boys and girls. When the moon rose and saw them warning themselves around the fire they had lit, it shouted out in alarm, The rainbow goblins are in the valley! 
The trees and the bushes took up the cry, and the flowers and the grasses and the animals and the waters passed it on, and by midnight the evil tidings had spread throughout the valley. very large book. The goblins could hardly contain their excitement. Soon all the colors of the rainbow will be ours, yellow gloated. We'll snatch it as it rises, said Green, when the colors are still fresh and creamy. The blue goblin cackled. Look at the roots dangling from the walls. They're straining to hear our plans. A lot of good it will do them or their friend, the rainbow. Hear the goblins planning their dark deeds. Finally exhausted by their scheming, the goblins fell asleep. Outside, the moon shone on. The mirror-like surface of the water and its magical light was reflected in the cave. Then, all seven goblins had a wonderful dream, the same wonderful dream about the paradise of Rainbow Land, where all you had to do was lie on your back and open your mouth, and the most succulent colors dripped down your throat. The dream went on and on. The greedy goblins drank and drank, and at dawn, just as their bellies were about to burst, they were awakened by a distant clap of thunder. Goblins sprang to their feet and rushed to the mouth of the cave. A storm, a storm, Red shouted. Look how the wind is driving it toward us, Orange cried. And all the goblins danced and pranced about in glee, for they knew that after the wildest morning thunderstorm come the most beautiful rainbow. Yellow was so proud of his plan of attack that he went over it again while each goblin tested his lasso. Red, don't forget that you must seize the left flank and I move in on the right, the violet goblin burst out excitedly. Before the last roll of thunder had faded from the valley, the goblins took up their pails and lassos and marched single file out of the cave. The sight that greeted them when they reached the meadow took their breath away. The rising arch of the rainbow, so rich with color and promise, almost blinded them. Trembling with excitement, Yellow finally managed to give the signal to attack. They're going to attack the rainbow. No, no.
stand by for technical difficulties. This is a very large book. Did I mention that? The goblins swung their lassos around and round and hurled them into the sky. But in that same instant, the rainbow vanished as if it had been swallowed up by the earth. The goblins were dumbfounded. Nothing like this had ever happened before. They stared up at their empty, outstretched lassos. stared at their empty, outstretched lassos, which a second later snapped back at them. Indigo wept, blue cursed, yellow stumbled, orange cried out, treachery. Violet tumbled to the grass, red raged, but the more they thrashed about, the more tangled up they became in their own lassos, until they had snarled themselves into a grunting, groaning mass of goblins on the ground. page. As they lay there helplessly, a flood of colors poured forth from all the flowers of the meadow. The flowers, screamed the blue goblin, the flowers. He had suddenly remembered the dangling roots that he had made fun of in the cave. Through their roots, the flowers had heard the goblin's plans and they had devised a counter plan to save the rainbow. The moment the attack was launched, the flowers had drained the colors of the rainbow into their petals, and as soon as the goblins became ensnared in their own lassos, the petals had let loose the deluge. So the goblins drowned in the colors they had come to steal, and no one in the valley wept. The rainbow itself was reborn more magnificently than ever. Out of gratitude, it lifted up the flowers that had saved it and transformed them into glittering dragonflies and butterflies and splendidly plumed birds. But since that time, the rainbow, but since that time, the rainbow has become more cautious. Now when it arches across the sky, it is careful not to touch the earth anywhere. No matter how you try to sneak, sneak up on it, you can never come back to the place 
where it begins or ends. The end. This is a picture, a portrait of the author. The author and the illustrator. So that, there you have it, boys and girls, the Rainbow gob Goblins. One of my favorites. I think it may have been a mistake to try and reach, read the, uh, the giant large version. It's very hard to see how to show hold the pictures up to show you guys where they're at I'm not being very good at that tonight so I don't know who's are any of our regulars out there getting all, all, all almost time to break time are my rat face Kaporians Flynn Lyra are you guys out there I think I, I think yeah just they're hiding behind that scary picture over there yep I think I can see them Junebug, are you and Penny watching tonight? What about Billy Boy? What about that other rat faced Kaporian that used to come in the store all the time? What was his name? Oh, Dylan! Dylan, are you watching tonight with a baby brother of yours? And how about you know who you are, the A S K E D kids? Remember, down on the Arizona border, got five, at least five rat faced Kaporians down there watching, I bet. Okay, way back. Hi, I can see you. Not really. I can barely see myself. <laughs> and I don't even have any good puns. Yeah, I think I'm fresh out. And guess what? I hate to admit it, there is no cookie jar here tonight. So. I don't know where I'd find a cookie. I don't even have a cookie jar to look in. Um, Old Rico wrote some several other books. He wrote a sequel that we'll maybe read another time uh, called The White Goblin. And this is even a scarier book than The Rainbow Goblins. But it's just as beautifully illustrated. Um, it's much harder to find though because it's out of print. Old Rico also wrote a kind of an adult book uh, based on the Wagnerian ring cycle of the the uh, ring of the nebula that was uh, done as a, a uh, opera cycle uh, you know we never ever seem to get around to doing books for the littlest ones uh, on on this show so I thought I would how many of you you may not read them anymore because you, maybe you've aged out of them but who remembers Elephant and Piggy and the Mo Williams books. I mean, come on. We like them, right? I mean, you couldn't get two better pals. And these books, uh, boy, Lyra and Flynn and I, we read these things to death when, when they were a bit younger. This one is called Elephant and Piggy in the Thank You Book. Gerald, I think, is the name of the elephant. And I think... Piggy's just Piggy, right? Piggy doesn't. Re Piggy's 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 name, but Gerald is the elephant's name. The thank you book. I am one lucky pig. I have a lot to be thankful so for. I had better get thanking. I am going to thank everyone who is important to me. Everyone. That's a really fun thing to do with Elephant and Piggy books is to take the parts of the different characters and read them out, out loud. Everyone? No way. You will forget someone. What do you think, boys and girls? Is Piggy going to forget? You will forget someone important. I will thank everyone. 
It will be a thankorama. Wow. Off I go. Squirrels. Piggy. Thank you for your great ideas. Aw, shucks. Snake. Piggy. Thank you for playing ball with me. The pigeon. Thank you for never giving up. And I am sorry you do not to get to be in our books. That is what you think. Thanking is nice, but you will forget someone. Ooh, doo -doo -doo -doo. I will not. Mouse, birdies, rhino, hippos, big sister, barky dog, pelican, bear, hippo, worms. Thank you all for being great friends. Aww. See that, Gerald? I am a thanking machine. Piggy, you have forgotten someone important. Do not worry, Gerald. My next thanks will be a big one. Thanks, whale. You are nice. So are you. Well, it was pretty big. <clears throat> but Gerald's thinking Piggy forgot to thank him, right? Ice cream penguin, thank you for your ice cream. It is what I do. Doctor, cat. Piggy. Thank you for being a great doctor. You are welcome. Brian, bat. Piggy. Thank you for drawing with me. That was fun. Piggy! You are forgetting someone. Someone very important. Really? Oh, now I know who you are talking about. The flies. Thank you for cooking with me. Anytime, dude. Not the flies, Piggy. I cannot think of anyone else I have forgotten to thank, Gerald. <coughs> Oops. I goofed. I goofed. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Elephant Gerald. You are the best friend a pig could ever have. That means a lot to me, Piggy. But I did not think that you, f but I did not think that you forgot me. Who did I forget to thank? Our reader. You forgot to thank our reader. You are right! Thank you for being our reader. We could not be us without you. You are the best. You did it! Great thanking, Peggy! Thanks to you. Yep. I am one lucky pig. The end. Thank you. So I'm going to have to push on now. No cookies in sight. Nope, not even a cookie jar. I could try these drawers over here. Oh, I can't even get them open. I, they probably don't have cookies in them anyway. So we're gonna we're gonna switch back. You remember the Hard on Quist books that I was so big on? They're like books. They're more books about children than for children. 
They're very strange, but they're wonderful, wonderful books, I think. So this one I decided I want to read to you tonight. It has Edward Gorey pictures. He's the illustrator. Um, Rhoda Levine is the author. Uh, Edward Gorey is a very famous artist, illustrator, and his books are not always kids' books either. They're very, very strange, just like Harlan Quist's books are. I think that's why I like them so much. And here, this is called, He Was There From The Day We Moved In. Who could be? possibly be? Let's find out. He was there from the day we moved in. He was there, sitting in the garden. I wonder if he comes with the yard, my brother Ogden asked as we looked through the window. No, no one mentioned him. When we bought this house, my father replied in a puzzled voice, I wonder what he wants. I think he's waiting for something, I said. He certainly did look like he was waiting for something. We, we all agreed. He is waiting for me, my brother Ogden shouted suddenly, running through the kitchen into the backyard. My brother Ogden is four. I'm sure he is waiting for all of us, my mother insisted, as we followed in Ogden's footsteps. We stood there in front of him. He seemed neither pleased nor disappointed to see us. Maybe he is waiting for me to jump up and down, my brother Ogden suggested, jumping up and down. And there finally we get a picture of who he is. Well, he's a big, giant, shaggy dog. Maybe he wants me to do a somersault. Ogden had just learned a somersault. I know, breathlessly, Ogden guessed again. He wants me to skip on two feet. I think, said my mother, placing a quieting and comforting hand on Ogden. He is waiting for something to eat. My mother is a very practical woman. I myself did not feel that that was the answer. But I watched my mother bring a bowl of milk, a raw hamburger, and a soup bomb, which she put down in front of, in front of him. Ogden ran to get a sticky lollipop. It was green. But after all, Ogden is only four. Well, he looked at everything. He gave everything a try, except, of course, the lollipop. I hate green myself. He's, he's waiting again. He's waiting for something else. What's he waiting for? Ogden was pretty troubled. There's the big doggy, big shaggy doggy, waiting, waiting, waiting. I'm sure he's waiting to get to know us, my mother said as she let us indoors. <coughs> he just needs to think about us overnight. Well, that night I certainly thought about him, of course. I didn't do anything silly like running to the window in my bare feet to see if he was still there. Ogden did that. He was there the next morning. It was raining, but he didn't seem to notice. My mother smiled. I am sure he is waiting to be invited in, she decided. She can never stand to see anyone sitting in the rain. Well, right away, Ogden ran out to him. My mother says, come on in the house. So, come on, come on. Nothing happened. So Ogden ran a line of cornflakes from the door to the dog. Come on, please, he added quietly. But he just sat there, his fur dripping, waiting. The days passed. We fed him. When it got cool, we covered him with a blanket. 
He didn't seem to mind. Well, all the time, Ogden tried harder and harder to find out what he was waiting for. Once Ogden thought he might want a piece of string, he tried to bring him a stray cat. He even tried a box of crayons and a calendar. Ogden thought he might want to be talked to. Do you know my brother spent a whole afternoon just sitting and talking to him? A whole afternoon is a pretty long time. Ogden told me once that he was sure he was waiting for a new toy truck. I really thought that Ogden was waiting for that himself. When nothing worked, Ogden began to calm down. Sometimes he didn't talk about him or visit him at all. Well, it's hard to stay interested in something, someone who is not interested in you. I don't care how old you are. I, however, never forgot about him and what he might be waiting for. I never stopped thinking about it, not even when I was asleep, not even when I was playing ball, not even when I was reading. Well, one night, I guess I was thinking harder than usual. I had been studying him as he sat in the moonlight with his eyes closed. Listen, I thought. You've got food, friends, a home. What is it you really want? Well, suddenly I knew just like that. He wanted a name. He was waiting for a name. The next morning I started a list. I wrote down every name I had ever heard. I looked for names in all the books we owned. I even looked on trucks and posters. Not that I intended to call him Matt's Machine Shop or Acme Wrecking or anything like that. I just wanted to get up a good store of possibilities. Naming a grown-up dog is not like naming a baby, you know. You have to find the exact one that suits him, the one that he has been waiting for. You just can't jump into a name like that. By dinner time, I had the longest list I had ever seen, and very interesting too, with the best names traced over in fountain pen. What are you drawing? Ogden asked. My brother Ogden can't read. I'm not drawing, I said. I'm writing. What are you writing? That's when I made my big mistake. I told Ogden what I was writing and why Ogden eye, Ogden's eyes grew wide when I told him. Sometimes he thinks I am pretty smart. His eyes got so wide that I didn't notice he was backing up while he talked. Suddenly he was gone. He was running toward the backyard yelling, I know, I know his name. He was in the yard before I could stop him. Sometimes four-year-olds can run faster than anyone. Wait, I cried, you've got to think before. But I guess he just couldn't stop. I was sort of glad my parents were doing the dishes so they didn't have to see what happened. Ogden ran right up to him, stopped short and pointed his nose. Your name, Ogden was breathless. Your name, I know your name, it's he lifted up an ear and whispered into it. Then he stepped back. I have never seen Ogden look so proud and happy. We didn't breathe for a whole minute. That dog just blinked. Then slowly, he looked up with sad and patient eyes. He blinked again like he was given a second thought. Then he stood up, shook himself, and he began to walk. 
like he was old and tired toward the end of the garden. Well, when Ogden told me the name he whispered, I must say that I would have walked away too. Well, whoever heard of naming a dog Marilyn? Even it is, if it is the name of the girl who used to live next door. I thought Ogden was pretty dumb, but I didn't tell him. He looked so sta sad standing there. I mean, really sad. I guess it was the way that Ogden looked that made me do it. Suddenly I took off after that dog. I got right in front of him and started talking. He kept padding along. Listen, I said, I've got a list of possible names you haven't heard yet. Names like Bouncer, Arthur, George, and Garson. He kept walking. He blinked. Oh, I know they might not be the right names, I added quickly, but I've got others, French names, names of places, adjectives, and everything. Well, you've just got to give me a chance. <coughs> he shook himself. <coughs> Listen, my father told me that a dog is man's best friend. Well, friends don't walk out on people because of one bad guess. Friends give people a second chance, you know. I think that's what got him. He blinked again, and then he sat down. Well, he is still sitting and waiting. He's closer to the garden's edge, but he is still there. Ogden hugs him a lot, though he doesn't say much to him. You know, I think we're bound to find the right name sooner or later. I myself am still working on the whole thing. He is waiting, I am thinking. We're both trying. Like my mother always says, that's about the best anyone can do. The end. Well, what did you think, boys and girls? It was kind of a sad story, but did it, did it have a happy ending? Kind of had a happy ending. Could have had a much sadder ending. Boo-hoo-hoo. What if the doggy walked away? Of course, he still didn't have a name. I wonder if that's what his problem is. Does he need a really, really good name? I bet he does. Well, <clears throat> maybe we got time to do one more. Is there a Shelly Belly? I mean, I love Shel Shel Silverstein. It's really hard. It's like your favorite books, you read them over and over again. I know Melissa when she was little. As soon as she got my daughter, as soon as she got done reading a book, she turned right around and started reading it over again. She could just do that forever. She could read a book five or ten times in a row. And wasn't much left of the book by the time she did that, but she certainly enjoyed them, if not devoured them. Um, Michael was a much, <clears throat> my son was a much more meticulous reader. I don't know that he ever read them twice. And when he got done with his books, they were in perfect condition. There was a lot of um, <clears throat> stress in our household back then because um, baby sister, that would be Melissa, would <clears throat> borrow her older brother's books. And Michael could always tell because when Melissa got finished reading the book, it was shredded and falling apart. It didn't have its dust jacket anymore. And he would understandably get quite mad at his little sister about that. If they lived in the same town, that would still go on to this day, I'm afraid. Um, Flynn, Lyra, maybe you could suggest, you rat-faced Kaporians out there, 
you could suggest uh, a favorite book to do on the next show. I think we're gonna we're gonna mix it up a little bit because, as I said at the beginning, uh, we'll do we'll finish May with the Kitty Show, and then we're gonna keep the YouTube channel going, and we'll we'll have more fun with it, and we'll just do it once a month. And then maybe I'll sneak in. We'll figure out whether it's like the first Thursday or the second, what what you want to call it. Or we'll figure all that out and let you know. But now we have our very own YouTube channel. We're gonna we're gonna name it and we're gonna brand it and we're gonna put a picture up on it. And gosh, it'll be our very own. Me and my YouTube. Who knew? I I just I don't even know what it means. How come it's YouTube? Why isn't it MeTube? You know, seems like that would be a better name for it. Well, I'm just being silly now, uh, but we're gonna have some fun with it, and I'll do some adult shows and poetry and some kind, kind of some of my favorite readings from what I call my ammo can library. We will be, we're working on our master plan to reopen the store. Watch for us to have maybe by appointment openings you could call up the store email and say can we come down are you open and we will probably start letting up to six people at a time to come in and start browsing around the store again and we very much look forward to seeing you all again we very much appreciate everybody's support these pat it's been two months since the corona invaded us can you believe that boys and girls two months Sometimes it seems like two years, and <clears throat> we're all getting a little restless. We've got to get doing stuff again, but don't forget to read books. we always got to keep reading books. The more you read, the more you're going to know. Maybe, I don't know if I can find one Shelly Belly, Shel Silverstein, to, um, <clears throat> I mean, he's, he's so silly, you know? <clears throat> Uh, hmm. How about <clears throat> a poem called The Peanut Butter Sandwich? I'll sing you a poem of a silly young king who played with the world at the end of a string, but he only loved one single thing, and that was just a peanut butter sandwich. His scepter and his royal gowns, his regal throne and golden crowns were brown and sticky from the mounds and drippings from each peanut butter sandwich. His subjects were all silly, Fools, for he had passed a royal rule that all that they could learn in school was how to make a peanut butter sandwich. He would not eat his sovereign steak. He scorned his soup and kingly cake and took his courtly cook to bake an extra sticky peanut butter sandwich. And then one day he took a bite and started chewing with delight. But he found his mouth was stuck quite tight from that last bite of peanut butter sandwich. His brother pulled, his sister pried, the wizard pushed, his mother cried. My boy's committed suicide from eating his last peanut butter sandwich. The dentist came and the royal doc, the royal plumber banged and knocked. But still, those jaws stayed tightly locked. Oh, darn, that sticky peanut butter sandwich. The carpenter he tried with pliers. The telephone man he tried with wires. The fireman they tried with fire. But couldn't melt the peanut butter sandwich. With ropes and pulleys, drills and coil. With steam and lubricating oil. For twenty years of tears and toil, they fought that awful peanut butter sandwich. Then all his real subjects came. They hooked his jobs, jaws with grappling chains and pulled both ways with might and main against the stubborn peanut butter sandwich. 
Each man and woman, girl and boy, put down their plows and pots and toys and pulled until crack! Oh, joy! They broke right through that peanut butter sandwich. A puff of dust. A screech, a squeak. The king's jaws opened with a creak. And then, in a voice so faint and weak, the first words that they heard him speak were, how about a peanut butter sandwich? The end. Okay, boys and girls, I think we're going to wrap it up for tonight's uh, episode seven already. Seven episodes. Can you imagine that? And we have barely scratched the surface of really great illustrated books and stories. The pictures make great stories. They're, and I love the artists as much as I do the writers of the books. It's hard to pick which one is my favorite. I have lots and lots more books to share with you. So we'll see you uh, next week. Bye-bye. Don't know when, don't know when, but we'll meet again someday.